Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Well, I love Ed and Jan's story. Um, and got young guys, if you're looking for a wife, the key is bring a world map to your second date and show them all the places that don't have food. That's what you do, right? That's so romantic, right? I want to say welcome, especially to those of you at our Mill Creek campus who are joining us and watching. We're grateful that you're with us as well. Um, you'll hear more about Ed and Jan's story and their remarkable ministry and how we can partner with them uh, in the weeks ahead. But we're grateful for that. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we've been hearing about translating your word into languages for people they can understand your love. And we are now going to open your word and ask you to speak to us because we too need to understand your love through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you like uh, courtroom uh, dramas and movies? Crime shows, courtroom shows, anybody? Yeah? Okay. Uh, what's the greatest cinematic courtroom drama in history? Some of you said A Few Good Men. Yeah, it's probably this, this, this one. It has to be in the running, right? I want the, you can't handle the truth. Um, or, or perhaps this would have to be in the top five. Certainly Atticus Finch uh, and To Kill a Mockingbird would have to be in, the, in, in there. My dad would say 12 Angry Men, but I didn't put that one on here. Or this one I think is maybe less known, but Miracle on 34th Street. I mean, come on. Santa Claus on trial has to be in the top five. And then last night I asked this question, and the first thing somebody yelled out was this movie, My Cousin Vinny. <laughs> I don't think it's top ten, but it's not a bad courtroom drama. If you've not seen it, the two Utes, the two what? Oh, you, this. All kidding aside, I want to talk to you about what is the greatest courtroom scene in all of history. It's a cosmic courtroom. It has the most significant, momentous courtroom drama that has the most to do, most to do with your life and heart and mine as well. The place we're going to go to learn about this courtroom scene might surprise you. It's the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Now, uh, Zechariah is one of the minor prophets. I said last week, uh, minor is an unfortunate title. It doesn't mean less important. It just means shorter. Uh, the, book, the minor prophets wrote shorter prophetic books than the major prophets, but they're certainly no less important. Zechariah, a little background here, is living in the time after the return of the exiles. Now, if you don't know your Old Testament history, that's totally fine. Here's how this works. Israel as a nation was divided in the northern and southern kingdom by corrupt kings, and as they divided and, and grew further rebellious and resistant to God's will, uh, foreign nations conquered them. First Assyria marched on them and, and destroyed the northern kingdom and reduced the southern kingdom where Israel and Jerusalem was uh, to rubble, and then after Assyrians came the Babylonians, who did worse than the Assyrians because not only did they conquer these two nations, but they carried three quarters of the population off into captivity uh, to live in Babylon. And that goes on for a number of years, a couple of generations. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, that's the story of the return. So the Jews are coming back to the promised land, to Israel and to Jerusalem. And they're rebuilding the city walls of Jerusalem, and they're rebuilding the temple. That's the time in history when Zechariah is writing his prophetic words, during the time of the return of the exiles. So think about it. You've come back generations later to the, to the promised land. You're reestablishing the city and the worship of, of the true God, Yahweh, and Zechariah is saying, basically, learn from the past. Don't make the mistakes of, your, of our forefathers. Trust God. Look at what he's done. He's brought us back. Trust him for what he will do as well. Now, throughout the book of Zechariah, there's a, he has a series of visions from God, eight of them in total. Some of them are about Israel's past, lessons from the past. Some of them are about the present, and some of them are about the future. We're going to look at the fourth vision, which is about Israel's present and our future, really. Israel, uh, uh, Zechariah is a wild ride. It's not linear. There's some crazy images in there, and you'll hear them in just a minute. So if you have your Bible, open to Zechariah chapter 3. We'll read the first 10 verses. Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 10. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, 
let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Well, really, that's pretty clear. I don't think it needs much explanation. I think you're all, right? What is going on in that passage? Okay, I, I don't know if you caught it, because there's a lot of crazy images in there. We'll try to talk about most of them. But did you catch the courtroom scene in the very beginning? It wasn't called a courtroom, but there's a, there's a trial going on. There's an accuser, right? Satan is the accuser, and he's accusing Joshua, the high priest. And there's, an, there's a defense attorney, the angel of the Lord, who's the advocate, we're told, standing before the Lord. So you get the scene, right? You've got Joshua, the high priest. Now, it doesn't say it specifically, but the inference is clearly they're in the temple, in the presence of the Lord. Joshua, the high priest, is the representative of the people of God. So we're meant to read this as if that's our representative. Joshua stands before the Lord representing the people of God, Israel in that day and the church today, us. And he's being accused by Satan in the presence of the Lord. He's also being defended by the angel of the Lord in the presence of the Lord. Now we're going to discover more about the identity and the roles of each of these characters as we go. The first thing I want you to see here is the reality of the accuser. The reality of the accuser. Notice in this vision, Satan is the accuser. Let's look at verse 1 again. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Beside Joshua the high priest, who is the symbolic representative of God's people, of us, in the presence of God, is this accuser, Satan. We don't think much about Satan. I'm guessing you don't think much about him on a daily basis, a weekly basis. If you do, you probably have images in your mind from contemporary society of the, you know, a guy in, in red tights, horns, pitchfork, tail, or maybe the little devil on your shoulder, you know, telling you to do bad things. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis has the older demon writing to a younger demon, Uncle Screwtape, say to Wormwood, we must always keep alive the modern imagination that the devil is a, is a comic figure in red tights. Why would that be the ploy of the evil one? Because then we, we dismiss him. We think of him as like this mythological figure, not, no one to worry about, not real, just the personification of evil in these ancient books. The little devil on your shoulder. I used to watch Tom and Jerry cartoons, right? And there was always the little angel and the little devil. And the devil always won in those cartoons. But for the Christ follower, our, meaning if you've trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, I think your main issue with your enemy is not temptation, but accusation. Let me try to explain that. I'm not saying that you aren't tempted. We are. Sometimes we're tempted by our own evil desires. James says that. By our, by our, by our own sin. By our, our own selfishness. Sometimes the, the devil does tempt us. But the primary role I think the enemy plays in your life is to accuse you in your heart. Let me try to explain what that means. To tell you you don't deserve God's grace. Even if you're here going, okay, I just don't believe in like a real devil. That seems so like, so... It, 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 we're, we're modern people, we're, 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 we're scientific, we, that just seems ridiculous to believe in a real devil. There is, even if you lay aside that for a minute, there is in every one of us this deep sense that we're not adequate. We're not as we should be. That we need something or some things to make us better. We have whole industries dedicated to this, don't we? To play on this sense that you have, that you're not good as you are, that you should be better physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way. My wife and I traveled to Israel with Pastor Brian and Lorene Coffey about three or four years ago now. And when we were there, we visited the Dead Sea. Amazing place, otherworldly place, strange place. Um, there's also like this gift shop resort at the Dead Sea. There's a resort everywhere. 
but uh, we're in this gift shop. Like, I want to be in the gift shop, right? But, but apparently Dead Sea Minerals and, and lotions and potions are, like, world famous, and we're supposed to buy some cosmetic stuff for my, my, my sisters and my mom and our family. So we're in this gift shop. Like, I don't even want to be there. And I got a little basket, and I'm staring at this wall filled with Dead Sea oils and whatever. I'm just I'm kind of, like, paralyzed, you know, by looking at all these things. My wife is buying something for her mom. I'm supposed to find something for my wife and, and for my mom and sisters. And I'm looking at this, I don't even know what it was, a lotion that you put on your face, I guess. And I'm looking at it, and it, it, there's a billion of them, and this lady walks up to me, and she says, you know, we have products for men, too. <laughs> I was like, she's like, she kind of points at my face, like, you know, for the, li- for the lions. I was like, I was incredulous. I don't need, I don't need a, the lotions from the Dead Sea, you know? But uh, if I'm honest, I kept looking in the mirror the rest of that trip going, what, what? <laughs> maybe I do have some lions, maybe I need some Dead Sea stuff, you know? Even in this flight home, I went in the bathroom on the plane. I was like, oh, man, I need some. <laughs> we can laugh about that. But the truth is, there's a sense in every one of us that we're not okay. That we could use some improvement. Why is it that your sin, old sins and failures flash before your mind with such vividness so easily? Does that happen to you? Where does that little voice come from that says to you, who are you to call yourself a Christian? My wife will sometimes joke with me when I do something that's ridiculous or a little off color. She'll say, you know, you're supposed to be a pastor. <laughs> and I told her, you can't say that anymore. She's just joking around, but it presses on something in me that I do feel like an imposter sometimes. I do feel like if you knew what goes on in here, you wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> you ever feel that way? Maybe not that way, but your way. I talked to a man one time, I, I said, are you a believer? Have you made a decision to trust Jesus? He says, well, I, I prayed that prayer, but I don't think I'm a Christian. I said, why not? He says, because if I was, I wouldn't have these thoughts. I wouldn't do these things. I'd be better than I am, he said. Or maybe it works like this for you. When bad things happen, you think, well, God must be punishing me, and I really must deserve it. Or if you want to tell somebody the truth, and it's a hard truth for them to hear, you think, well, who am I to say anything? I've got my own issues. They wouldn't listen to me. Or why would God listen to me when you pray? You hear Ed say he thought prayers would bring you past the ceiling? How funny is that, that he takes a bike ride to Toledo for five days to go party with his cousin who invites him to a Bible study becomes a Christian. God is awesome. But he says, maybe maybe you think your prayers are like, "Ah, why would God listen to me after all I've done? My point is, there is an accuser. Revelation Chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. We'll talk more about the resolution that this speaks to, but it's saying there's a reality. There's an accuser accusing you before God day and night in your own heart. Now, I want you to note something. Satan is not telling God... What a mess up you are. Who's he telling? He's not telling God how screwed up Joshua is. He's telling who? Joshua. The accuser is accusing you, but doing so in front of God to keep you from the Father. Do you know one of the most common recurring dreams uh, for all people is some form of being unprepared for something? You ever had the dream of it's test day and you didn't study? Or, or you wake up and you're late. Or you wake up and you have to go speak and you have no pants on. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> it's this deep, deep inside of us, this sense that we're not okay. That we're inadequate. That we're not acceptable. Secular psychologists will tell us, well, this is just low self-esteem. You need higher, greater self-esteem. You need to look inside, like Stuart Smalley tells us, stare in the mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. That only works at the surface. That doesn't deal with the deeper problem. You need something much more deeper, much deeper, much more powerful. And here's the reason why. It's because there's some truth in these accusations. There's some truth in the whispers that you feel in your soul. This is the condition of the accused. The condition of the accused. Joshua the high priest is standing there before the Lord, and he's got an accuser on his right and a defender on his left. And look at verse 3, Zechariah 3, verse 3. It says this, 
It's a simple little statement, but it's very important. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. It's easy to think, well, he just, you know, he came, he was just dirty. He just was underdressed for the occasion. It's much, much more significant than that. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, this idea of clothing and filthy clothing and clean clothing has to do with our acceptability, what the Bible calls our righteousness. I'm guessing the word righteousness is not a word you use very often in common conversation. We've talked about this before. If you're new around here, those of you who have heard it before, what does righteousness mean? It means to be right with. In right, it's a relational term. It means to be in right relationship with God and with other people. So to be, how does a man or woman get right with God? That's righteousness. How does that happen? We're told here that Joshua is standing there and he's not right. He's wearing filthy garments. It's not that God has some weird dress code. Sometimes we, we make that mistake. You can come here wearing whatever you want. Just wear something, right? <laughs> Psalm 132, verse 9, may your priests be clothed in righteousness and your saints shout for joy. This is a reference to how the high priest was supposed to come in the presence of the Lord, clothed in righteousness. In fact, there are very specific, detailed accounts in Leviticus about what the high priest was supposed to wear, how it was supposed to be made, what it was supposed to look like, the, the vestments, the garments, the turban, the robe, all of it. Why? Because symbolically, you come into the, Lord, the presence of the Lord and you must be right but none of us are right. That's part of this vision. The image is that we are not right. Isaiah 64, verse 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. The Hebrew word here for uh, filthy in uh, Zechariah 3, verse 3, filthy garments, is a, a word that, it, it's the word sho'i. It literally means uh, vile, disgusting, excrement. So it's not just like, you know, he was wearing work clothes. He was a little dirty. It's, he's, he reeks. It's disgusting. You can't stand the stench in the sight. It's so vile. Go outside, if you, like, I, the snow has melted, and I notice my backyard has a lot of little surprises in it from our dog. So imagine going rolling in all of that for the next six hours straight. That, that, that you get just a hint of what this word is communicating. Our sin is vile, disgusting, and cannot be in the presence of God. So when the accuser accuses you, part of the reason that's real for us is there's some truth to it. You're not okay. We like to say it's okay not to be okay around here, but God doesn't want you to stay that way. Did you hear that? It's okay not to be okay. Just don't stay that way. Our culture tells you that you just have to accept yourself as you are. That's the key. The gospel says, actually, no. You're not acceptable as you are. That's the truth. So it's not just a matter of looking inside yourself or telling yourself that you're wonderful. That will not work at the deepest level. So what will? What will do it? 1 John 3, verse 20, we're told, for whenever our hearts condemn us, that's the accusation, right? Does your heart ever condemn you? God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. We're going to unpack what that means here. Let's look back at Zechariah's vision. Let's understand what God asked Zechariah to do, and, and what does that mean for us today? Look, look at verses 2 through 4 again. Zechariah 3, verses 2 through 4. This is sort of the emotional center of the heart of the passage. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. The key to understanding what's going on here is to understand this mysterious figure who's referenced multiple times, the angel of the Lord, the one who's called the advocate standing there. Who is this angel of the Lord? There are lots of places in the Old Testament where angels show up. Sometimes they're named Gabriel and Michael. But when you see this phrase, the angel of the Lord, used in this way, it's a different reference. 
Let me, let me try to explain this. In verse 2, the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Does that strike you as odd? The Lord says, the Lord rebuke you. Jeff says, Jeff tells you. Like that's a little, it's oddly worded, right? The Lord is saying, the Lord rebuke you. And then in verse 4, the angel says, take off the garments. I have taken your iniquity away. The angel is saying, I've forgiven sin. Who is it that can stand in the presence of the Lord and speak as the Lord and take away sin? You, it's not C.S. Lewis, but there's another church answer. You get this one right. <laughs> Jesus. You think, what, what? Jesus is in a vision to Zechariah in the Old Testament? Yes. This is God the Son standing before God the Father at the side of the accused being the advocate. This is what theologians call a theophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity. There are a number of them in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is a reference to the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, standing there as the advocate for the accused. This goes to the very heart of what we cling to as Christians, what we believe in the gospel. Jesus is our advocate. Now, in verse 2, there's this phrase about a brand plucked from the fire. Did you catch that? What is that about? Well, my, my son Benjamin, our oldest, I mean, youngest, when he was a little guy, he was kind of a pyro. He's still actually a pyro. But when he was little, I worried about it more. We would have bonfires in the backyard in our fire pit, and he always wanted to burn everything. Burn the Coke can, burn his toys, burn his shoes, whatever he could put in there, he wanted to put in the fire, you know. But his favorite thing was to put a stick in the fire and let it get, you know, burn on the end. And then pull it out when it's glowing and wave it all around, you know, which is really safe. My wife loved that. But what happens to that stick when you wave it around? Eventually it goes out, right? It's charred, it's burned, but, it's, but eventually that fire goes out. I always think of that image when I read this passage, right? A brand plucked from the fire. What your advocate, the angel of the Lord Jesus is saying, is that I have plucked this one from the fire. The fire is a symbolic representation of the judgment of God, the condemnation for sin. In other words, this one I've chosen, I've plucked out of the fire. They're not gonna be condemned. The fire can't touch them because I've plucked them out. That's forgiveness. That's dealing with the consequences of our sin. But that's not all there is. There's another image, and that of taking off filthy garments and putting on clean ones. Did you catch that? These two strange images are giving you a picture of what it means to be in the grace of Jesus Christ. Because the second image is the image of clothing. Isaiah 61, 10 says this, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Do you understand what this means? You've been, if you're in Christ Jesus, plucked out of the flames. Not only that, you're not just a charred stick. You're clothed with righteousness. So I'll put it this way. Not only does my sin go to Jesus, but his righteousness comes to me. There's two transactions that, ha that happen here. When you're in Christ, it's not just, I forgive you, now do better. It's, I forgive you, and I cover you with my righteousness. So that when the Lord looks at you, he sees me. My righteousness. That's what the robe means. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He goes off and screws things up, right? And he comes home and the father runs down the road to meet him and the father does three things. You know what they are? Kisses him. Right? I like kissing my sons. They don't like it so much now, but I still kiss them. He puts a ring on his finger, which was a symbol of the authority of the family. And what does he do next? Puts a robe on him, which is a symbol of the acceptance into the family. He covers him. The father covers him. This is the image we're being given here. So you've been plucked out of the flames of judgment and you've been covered in the righteousness of Jesus. That's what it means. It's not just forgiveness. So in other words, when we're told that Jesus is your advocate, he's not just going to the Father going, look, I know Jeff is a screw up. I know he messed up again, but could you just let him off one more time? Yes, I know it's like the 27,000th time, but could you just give him a break? I mean, could you just take it easy on him? I mean, how long could that go on if that's the, what, how it worked? Eventually, God's going, I think we've passed the, you know, the limit here. He's not just doing that. He's not pleading for mercy. He's arguing for justice. Because your sins have been paid for. 
at the cross. It would be unjust to punish you for something that Christ has already paid for and you're already covered in his righteousness if you are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to take you through a few passages here in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul spells this out in different ways. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Sounds like a courtroom, doesn't it? Your charges have been dismissed because it's been paid. It's been nailed to the cross. So those things are set aside, plucked out of the flames. And Romans 8, chapter, 31, or chapter 8, verses 31 to 34. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. You have an advocate. Who's going to bring a charge against you? Who's going to come against you? If God stands at your side and says, this one I've plucked out of the flames, this one I've covered in my righteousness, this one belongs to me. You notice that Satan doesn't even get a word in in this vision? Not a word. Before he can say a word, he's accusing the heart of Joshua. The angel of the Lord says, rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. I own this one. I think, friends, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God didn't give you a new heart and forgive your sin so that you could be defeated and discouraged by the lies of the accuser. He didn't do all that so that you could muddle through life believing the worst. He did it so that you would have an advocate at your side telling you the truth about who you are in Christ. Listen to this passage, my favorite of the ones we're reading, and I hope this will encourage your heart. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. It's so, he's so tender here because we need to hear it like kids. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you love that verse? Memorize that one. I, little, little children, I don't want you to sin. I want you to walk in the way of God, but I know you're going to screw up. And when you do, don't listen to the accuser, because you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Which voice are you listening to? So it's not a matter of like, la, 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 I'm not listening to you, you know, and I'm listening to Jesus. In fact, what, the truth is, what you're accused of is not only half the story. We should walk right to the, our accuser and say, it's worse than you say. I am a wreck. But look who has covered me. I don't have to pretend it's not true that I have issues. I have issues. So do you. You got issues. <laughs> but I've been covered in the righteousness of Jesus. And the more I listen to that voice, my advocate, the more I walk in his righteousness. That's what God wants for us. One of the places this is put most beautifully is in C.S. Lewis's uh, book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It's my, well, I shouldn't say my favorite. They're all so great. But it's one of my favorites. <laughs> How's that for hedging? Uh, this is the book that begins, there once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> Uh, uh, Eustace is just a big pain. And he becomes a dragon in the story by sleeping on dragon's gold and dreaming dragon thoughts and becoming, it's, it's symbolic of his corrupt heart. He becomes like that which he's pursuing, his behavior. Corrupted, selfish, greedy, wicked. And he realizes this. And he's trying to tear off his own dragon skin with his dragon claws, but it doesn't work. There's another knobby, scaly skin underneath every time he does that. Some of you know this part of the story. It's so beautiful how Lewis writes this. He wrote it for kids, but I really think it's for us. And then Aslan, the lion, who is the Christ, Aslan, by the way, is a Turkish word for lion, who's the Christ figure in the story, comes and, and is going to deal with Eustace's condition. But it's very profound. Listen to how it goes. Then the lion said to me, but I don't know if it spoke, mind you, you will have to let me undress you. 
I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty, near, pretty nearly desperate now, so I just lay flat down on my back and I let him do it. The first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right to my heart. And when he began peeling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know if you've ever picked a scab off of a sore place, it hurts like billy but it's such fun to see it coming away. When he peeled the beastly stuff right off, and there I was, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. Well, I didn't like that very much, for I was tender underneath now that I had no skin on, and he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. As soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone, and then I saw why I had turned into a boy again. This is really profound stuff here. Lewis is saying, you can't undress yourself. Notice in the vision for Ze- of Zechariah, God doesn't say, get out of here, Zechariah, change your clothes. Go put a different robe on, then come back when you're presentable. That's not how it works. He says, take it off of him, and we will dress him. That's what Lewis is saying. This is how it works with the gospel. It's not that you get off your own old filthy stuff and put on clean clothes, and then God says, mm, good enough. It's that he must undress you, stripping off the filth by his grace at the cross, and he will dress you in his righteousness. It's done for you. And Jesus, the advocate, by the Holy Spirit, to those who belong to him, is constantly telling you, that's not who you are anymore. You're not filthy anymore. You're not in the flames. You belong to me. I've rescued you. I've plucked you out. I've clothed you. Now live like it, because I love you. That's your advocate. I really believe, for many of us, our biggest issue is not temptation to do really bad stuff. It's believing the advocate. Trusting that what he says about you is true and not the voice of the accuser. Far many of us go through life listening to the accuser. If they only knew, you're a fraud, you're an imposter, God can't forgive you again. Those are lies. Trust your advocate. Now last... At the, at the end of the passage I read to you, we don't have time to get all the images, but right at the end of the passage in Zechariah 3, there's these two verses. They won't be on the screen, but I'm going to just read them to you. And this is right at the end. Now remember, Zechariah is talking about what's happening now in Israel and what is to come for Israel's future and for our future. And he says, I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. When, now, now Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, happened every year, over and over again, high priests going to the temple, trying to remove symbolically the iniquity of the people over and over and over again. And here God says, someday, someday in the future, I'm going to remove the iniquity of the people in a single day. When was that? Where did that happen? <laughs> right? The cross. In a single day, in a single act, God comes and removes the iniquity of those who will trust him. And then listen to what he says, and in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Here's what he means. Vine and fig tree were symbols of God's blessing. And I love that it, the word neighbor's in there. We are those neighbors. He's saying, through you, Israel, who learned to trust in my Messiah and me, I will bring salvation and grace and blessing to all people. Who are the neighbors? The Gentiles. To the Jews, there were Jews and everybody else. Those are your neighbors, he's saying. In other words, I'm going to bless all people through this removing of the iniquity in a single day. Here's how I'd put it. Those of us who know the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ and have him as our advocate ought to be the best neighbors in the world. I don't just mean you shovel your neighbor's driveway. I mean, we should be the most inviting, gracious, kind people on the planet because we know what he's done for us and what he could do for someone else. Isn't that beautiful? On that day, when people realize what I've done for them, you will invite your neighbors to come and enjoy my blessing. That's what the church is supposed to be, a place where the people who have Jesus as their advocate gather to worship, praise him, be equipped and filled up to go out into the world and tell our neighbors about the blessings of the vine and the fig tree. So plant a vine, grow a fig tree in your yard, invite your neighbors, tell them about the goodness of your God. I'll just close with this, friends. 
I know some of you intellectually believe in Jesus, but you're listening to the wrong voice. You are being accused day and night. And God is saying to you, I didn't pay for your sin at the cross and rise from the grave to clothe you in my righteousness so that you would live a discouraged, defeated life listening to the accuser. Trust your advocate. Little children, I tell you these things so you won't sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Let's pray. God, we thank and praise you for this ancient and strange prophecy which comes down to us and speaks to us about the truth that we walk in today, or at least we want to. That you have rescued us from the flames and you've clothed us in your righteousness. You've brought us into your family. You've called us sons and daughters. Father, help us to trust the voice of your son who speaks to us by the Holy Spirit that we belong to you. Thank you for what you've done. It's beyond our comprehension, beyond our ability to ever repay. But that is the measure of grace. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, our advocate. You are the righteous one. Amen.